we head back to the States uh, in 1934. That was another big year for general strikes, right? 65,000 textile workers walked off the job starting in North Carolina. One factory would shut down and the workers would all basically go from town to town. They were like factory towns at the time, calling out other workers on strike. And then workers in that plant would also walk off the job and come on strike. And the crowd would grow. I and mean, we're talking about the self-activity of the working class at its most effective. The New York Times warned, the grave danger of the situation is that it will get completely out of the hands of the leaders. For workers, it was the other way around. The real danger was posed by business leaders and the representatives in government. The way rulers responded was with some of the worst bloody violence in US history. I mean, just coming in and shooting down peaceful pickets, bayonetting in the South, bayonetting, using bayonets to kill strikers who were wearing, ironically, peaceful picket buttons. Now, uh, 1934 also saw taxi strikes, saw trucking strikes, warehouse strikes from all across the country, right? This was, this was happening nationwide. Right? We just talked about what was going on all through the South. In Toledo, Toledo, Ohio, workers from auto plants led a strike. Right? Radical socialists were being voted into the leadership of unions because people wanted to see radical change instead of just fucking platitudes from rich people. You know? So under the leadership of one of these radicals, uh, the strike took in the unemployed of Toledo who would normally have been hired as scabs or strike workers to replace these striking workers, right? So check this out. In each of these cases, I think it's important to say that radicals of one kind or another were elected to the leadership. They were very democratic. The first one was the American Workers' Party, which was led by A.J. Musty, and they had the ingenious idea of mobilizing unemployed people to join the picket lines. That kept the unemployed from scabbing or strike breaking on the strike. It brought them into the struggle. And essentially, that is how the Toledo Auto Light strike was won. So basically what they did was, uh, with the help of the rank and file, they, they fed these unemployed. They protected them. They, they provided them housing if that's what they needed. And they used the power of mutual aid to bring them into the strike and help them out and give them a reason to join the strike. You know, they, they wanted their lives to be better as well. So the auto companies had basically lost their way to replace employees. So the National Guard was sent in and a bunch of strike leaders were arrested. So much like Winnipeg, they organized a, 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 a march, right? And these guardsmen, they threatened these strikers who refused uh -oh. to fight. So they opened fire on the strikers. The strikers fight back. Uh, and eventually, once the bosses and the government saw that these strikers are not backing down, they recognized the unions, they increased the wages, and then they rehired the workers to go back in and start doing their jobs, like you see over here. That was only because the, the strikers stood in solidarity with themselves. Now, San Francisco, on the other hand, becomes a, a war zone, right? As longshoremen uh, went on strike and garnered uh, the support of basically every union in the city again. Uh, and because of the state of the economy in, in the 30s, longshoremen didn't have steady work. They'd all have to go down to the docks and be picked by a foreman. There was like a lot of, um, a lot of bribery happening and a lot of people described it as a slave market. Right. All of a sudden, this was the time in history where white folks were like, oh, holy shit, is, is this what we've been doing to black and brown people? Oh, my God, this is awful. <laughs> we should not do this anymore. <laughs> now, once the, the strike began, 100,000 workers had walked off the job, and the strikes were all peaceful. They were all peaceful. So in order to instigate it, the National Guard was called in to protect law and order by blowing up a little part of the city. They just had to 
blow it up a little bit uh, and maintain that law and order. And you had New Deal advocates like Hugh Johnson and a bunch of union leaders that were condemning the general strike, right? But the rank and file wouldn't budge. So here's what, here's what uh, Hugh Johnson had to say about that. You are living out here under the stress of a general strike. Now the right of dissatisfied men to strike against a recalcitrant employer is inviolate. But the general strike is quite another matter. That is a threat to the community. That is a menace to government. That is civil war. Uh, that guy's a Democrat that's advocating for the New Deal <laughs> with FDR, by the way. Who, who just called a general strike in 1934 a civil war amongst the people. <laughs> so by the end of that strike, the longshoremen didn't get what they wanted, right? Uh, the military force had ended up winning out in San Francisco. So unfortunately, San Francisco uh, was, was a loss uh, as a general strike. But Minneapolis, Minnesota was a completely different story. In 1934, Minneapolis Teamsters led a, a strike of truck drivers and delivery men, and they got super organized in Minneapolis and started using military tactics to push back against the government agitators. They monitored police radios, gave instructions in code, and created disguised patrols to locate and subdue potential strike breakers. At the same time, the Teamsters made sure that hospitals were kept running and food delivered to the hungry. A committee of 100 rank and file strikers was elected to direct day-to-day -day activities. Women created their own auxiliary group to organize demonstrations at City Hall, nurse injured strikers, and prepare meals. The Teamsters had massive support among other Minneapolis workers. 35,000 building trades workers walked out in sympathy, as did the city's taxi drivers. The Farm Holiday Association, a militant farmers group, provided contributions of food. Hundreds of non-Teamster workers showed up at strike headquarters daily to offer their services. Now, because they were able to take care of each other, uh, the cops attacked every last one of them. Uh, the, <laughs> the, the first fatality was a, was a guy named Henry Ness, as you can see here. His funeral garnered about 40,000 people uh, who were in attendance. And the public opinion was for the Teamsters and their demands. So instead of listening to the public, the National Guard gets called in again. And labor leaders are all arrested and then put into camps. And once that happened, I think everybody was like, oh, shit, this is a real bad look. Uh, I, I feel like this camp idea is going to get like a real bad rap one day. We, mm, mm, mm. we should probably not do this, right? So once that happened, uh, the Teamsters basically won their demands for better pay and better work conditions. So the, so the Minneapolis general strike was, was a massive success, a massive success. I do want to point this out. This is the use of military force in American streets over the right to protest and strike against inequality. So mm -hmm. it's been done before, and it was validated by Democrats and Republicans alike. This is another point of proof that the removal of Trump is basically meaningless without the removal of a corrupt warmongering duopoly that's ready to murder its own citizens asking for human rights. Authoritarianism in America has existed long before 2016. It's been around for a very long time. Weeks, months. Weeks, at least, at least a couple weeks, you guys. At least a couple <laughs> weeks before 2016. Yeah. Now, after uh, 1934, you see the Wagner Act that was signed in 1935, and that legislatively gave collective bargaining rights to workers. It was, it was the, uh, the first piece of legislation that strengthened the unions, and it wouldn't have happened 
without these general strikes that were happening all across the country that really put pressure on these uh, on these legislators that were kind of toeing the line, right? The, the Democrats have always kind of been pro-business uh, and and pro-employer uh, rather than rather than pro-worker pro essentially. So after World War II, right? Fast forward after World War II, uh, there is a fear that organized labor would grow even stronger. So you had Senator Taft out of Ohio and Senator Hartley out of New Jersey who put mm -hmm. forth a piece of legislation to undo the Wagner Act. Now, I think that this is proof that without any shadow of a doubt that nothing good has come out of the state of New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can unequivocally. <laughs> Bruce Trump went bankrupt there. <laughs> Trump did go bankrupt there, so I guess. <laughs> Bruce Springsteen. Oh, yeah, I knew yeah. fucking somebody was gonna bring up Springsteen. All right, got you there, man. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna go on my Springsteen rant. This might, this might get me canceled, but I'm gonna fucking. Do <laughs> Listen, Bruce Springsteen also not great from, uh, from New Jersey. Uh, look. The man says that he's for the working class, but he calls himself the boss? Come on. You made one point. point. Come, on. <laughs> Come on, Bruce. Fair enough. <laughs> right? If you were really for the people, you'd call yourself the fucking proletariat, dog. The like, worker, yeah. <laughs> all I'm going to say is his mansion has gates. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> his mansion has gates. This, that's the most, yeah, I feel like that's the most controversial statement I've made all night. <laughs> <laughs> There's just people unsubscribing from my channel right now. <laughs> and that has been your fork full of noodles for this week. Uh, if you enjoyed this episode, if you like the content that we're putting up on this channel, make sure that you like, share, and subscribe to this channel. All three of those things help this channel grow, help uh, other people see this channel and discover this channel. Um, platforms like YouTube and Facebook and uh, you know other, uh, other platforms don't particularly like to show content like this, show um, engaging content that talks about history and the truth and what's actually going on with our system at, at, at hand. So uh, I depend on you guys, the viewers, that if you guys like it, to make sure that you hit the like and then make sure that you share it with uh, whoever you think is gonna enjoy uh, content like this, whether it's a friend or a family member or an enemy, whoever it is, uh, you guys could share that with, that would be awesome. And make sure that you're subscribed. Um, I, there, there's the more people that subscribe to this channel, again, the more that it'll be shown to other people and the more updates you'll get from my channel. I release videos uh, pretty consistently, uh, at least uh, a few times a week. Um, I do a live stream uh, via my Facebook page uh, uh, two or three times a week as well, where you get to talk to me and interact with me while we go over some you know, news stories that might have fallen through the cracks or mainstream media just doesn't touch at all. So uh, yeah, I hope you guys do that. Uh, the other way that you can help support this show is uh, by making a financial contribution if that is uh, if that is possible for you to do, uh, it is it is not a necessity. Uh, all of my content is going to be available for free. Very little goes behind a paywall. But if you do become a sustaining member via my website, uh, via Patreon, or via Bandcamp, it does give you unreleased stand-up comedy and storytelling content that nobody else gets. That's a little perk. That's a little thing behind the paywall. Uh, you get early uh, access to full episodes of Forkful of Noodles. Like these are, these are segments of a much larger piece. You get the larger piece before anybody else does. You get early access to that. Uh, you get uh, free tickets to the live virtual stand-up comedy shows where these clips are from um, and, uh, and a bunch of other stuff. There's gonna be some merch coming up. Um, I'm, gonna be, uh, I'm gonna be releasing some new merch as well. So uh, keep your eyes uh, out peeled for that. And that'll be available, all will be available on my website at krishmohan.com. That's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N.com. Uh, I also have a new stand-up comedy album, and um, that is available on all of the platforms you get your comedy stuff from. 
And uh, one of the things I'm doing with these virtual stand-up comedy shows and the uh, merch sales, whether it's like the t-shirt stuff or if it's the album, is I am going to be donating half of the um, half of the sales to a grassroots organization, uh, you know, like a mutual aid or a particular a grassroots venue that I've worked with um, or, you know, uh, an independent journalist or uh, something along those lines, something grassroots, so people that are bringing you the truth and bringing you the information, people that I use as sources for, for, for my comedy and for these pieces as well. So, uh, you know, by, by contributing and, and buying tickets or, or buying merchandise or buying those albums, uh, you, you're, you're contributing to also help um, a grassroots organization grow. Uh, so that is, uh, that's a cool little perk that I'm trying to do. I'm trying to do my part uh, during, during this crazy age that we're all living in. So uh, I hope you consider going through the links, uh, checking out what you want to uh, be a part of, checking out what you can donate to, um, and, uh, and help, uh, help, help this channel grow, uh, help me put food on the table, earn a living, all that sort of stuff. Um, and help the, some a, a grassroots organization um, grow and uh, you know find their path and what they're doing uh, to to make this place a better world for everybody. So um, stay tuned. There's a lot more content coming up on this channel. Thank you so much for watching this video. Thank you so much for uh, being a subscriber or or considering becoming a subscriber for this, this channel. Uh, until the next video, uh, see you on the road.